I'm very pleased again today to be joined by Professor David Feldman, who is the Rouse Ball Professor for English Public Law. And David, today we're going to discuss um, a little bit about uh, human rights law. And could you tell me a little bit more about um, your expertise in this field to begin with? Well, I've been working on civil liberties and human rights in domestic law for uh, 30 plus years now. Um, and using international human rights law as a framework for evaluation of domestic law. Um, then when the um, EU began to develop uh, fundamental rights principles and the UK uh, enacted later and quite separately the uh, Human Rights Act, um, which makes it possible to get remedies for violations of rights under the European Convention on Human Rights uh, in domestic courts. And of course the European Convention is entirely separate from the EU and has nothing whatever to do with it. Um, I started to become interested in those various separate uh, uh, interactions, uh, the, you know, the, the, the systems themselves and the interactions between them. And, and now we have a situation where um, the uh, EU, the Court of Justice, um, makes um, use of the um, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, general principles of EU law uh, derived from uh, the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, um, but also from the constitutional traditions of the um, member states, the common constitutional traditions, and of course most of the member states have constitutional, constitutional traditions which um, include a body uh, of enumerated um, rights, fundamental rights or constitutional rights. Um, and so the uh, body of fundamental rights in EU law is part of EU law as general principles of EU law and that has effectively the same um, status as the treaties as part of the constitution of the EU. Um, then in the EU uh, there was a charter of fundamental rights which the member states uh, agreed in 2000 um, which was non-binding and that was uh, partly inspired by the European Convention on Human Rights but went much further um, whereas the um, the, the convention rights are um, almost entirely um, individual rights and political rights, particularly things like freedom of expression, um, freedom from interference with private uh, life and the home and family life, freedom from torture, freedom from um, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, um, fair trial rights, um, rights not to be enslaved or subjected to fall, a whole range of things like that. The classic old-fashioned human rights, um, what are sometimes called first-generation human rights. Um, the uh, EU Charter that was agreed in 2000 was very much broader and included a whole range of, of very detailed equality rights, um, rights r relating to disability, age, um, what, what's sometimes called um, uh, third generation rights, economic and social rights, collective rights, rights of people because of the groups that they belong to or the, rather than because of their own particular um, characteristics. Um, and in 2000, this very extensive range of rights was, was in, in, encapsulated in a charter, but on the understanding that it wasn't going to be legally enforceable. Yes. Um, what happened um, seven years later in December 2007, the Lisbon Treaty, when the new EU treaty structure was put in place with the Treaty on European Union and Treaty um, on the Functioning of the European uh, 
union. Um, as part of that major overhaul of, of the EU treaties, um, Article um, uh, 6 of the um, Treaty on European Union provided for the um, Charter of Fundamental Rights, the EU Charter, to have legal effect in EU law for the first time and also to apply to member states when they were acting um, in the field of EU law. Um, and, and the uh, UK and Poland and the Czech Republic negotiated or thought they had negotiated something of an opt-out from the applicability of the Charter in, in Protocol 30 to the, uh, the, the Lisbon Treaty, but it turned out subsequently that it didn't operate as a, an opt-out. And so um, we are, as, a, as the UK, um, subject to EU fundamental rights law when the, e, when the UK is operating in the field of competence of the EU institutions. Um, and th that um, means we have a body of these rights, both um, social and economic rights and uh, political rights, um, which are binding on us through the doctrine of uh, the primacy of EU law. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, which have effect within the co areas of competence of, of the EU alongside the general principles which I mentioned earlier which are derived from the European Convention and other treaties to which the member states have contributed plus their common constitutional traditions. Um, and all of that operates as a binding part of EU law. That's in addition to the um, European Convention on Human Rights, which is a multilateral treaty binding 47 countries at the moment, um, with a, uh, an adjudicative body purely in respect of human rights compliance, convention rights compliance, which is the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And the European Court of Human Rights is the final um, authority on the interpretation and application of those convention rights. There is a link between the convention and the EU, even though I said they're completely separate. The link is that, um, first of all, in the Lisbon Treaty in, in, uh, and the, the, the TEU and the TFEU, Treaty on European Union, Treaty on the Function of the European Union, um, there are provisions which um, require the, um, the, the Charter, the, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, to be interpreted so that it uh, gives no less protection to the overlapping rights than would be provided under the European Convention. The Court of Justice of the European Union refers, when necessary, to the provisions of the Convention to make sure that happens. And in the Treaty on European Union, uh, Article 6, there was a requirement that the Union as a whole should become a uh, party to the European Convention. This would be rather odd in a way because you don't normally get multinational organisations becoming parties to international treaties and it would be particularly complicated given that all the members of the EU, the individual member states of the EU, are already parties to the Convention in their own right. Um, but in fact, for a variety of reasons, um, eight, no, nine nearly years on, 
um, the EU still hasn't become a party to the convention. So we have this sort of situation where the EU institutions can refer to and should refer to convention uh, rights and convention case law. But the two systems aren't meshed. Okay, so bearing all this in mind, what do you think the implication would be uh, in the event of a, a vote to leave in the referendum? Mm. Well, the, the immediate effect would be zero because there'd then, as we know, be a fairly long process of negotiating before a treaty was agreed to, um, uh, to separate uh, f from the, uh, the EU. If we reached the point where such a treaty came into force, uh, we can probably assume that uh, for most purposes, EU law would no longer apply directly in the UK. Um, when that happened, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, would no longer be applicable to the UK, except so far as any new treaty, part of the separation treaty, um, required it to be given effect. Now that might happen, for example, if we had an agreement to share uh, a single market. Um, so the single market rules would continue to operate. Do you think EU charter acceptance might be part of, of the negotiation process I uh, as I part of the, of the single market? I think it's quite likely that that, that, that would be so. And, and there are a number of um, areas in the charter um, relating, for example, to employment rights, mm -hmm. um, which might be insisted on simply because if the UK's um, employers and exporters didn't have to comply with those, they'd have a competitive advantage relative to um, producers and, and um, commercial operations in other parts of, of Europe. So it's almost difficult to unbundle those rights from free movement? Places. Yes, the principle, because the principle <coughs> of applying the charter and also the general principles which give rise to fundamental rights is that they apply to states in areas in which the EU has competence. If there are areas following our leaving the EU where it was required that we should still observe EU rules, then it would be very difficult uh, to see why the fundamental rights provisions should be separated from those. Sure. But that, of course, would be something that might be up for negotiation during the process of working towards a, a, an exit. Yes. So do you think um, it could be characterised as an exit being the start of a new um, sort of revolution in fundamental rights for the UK, whereby we might um, implement our own Bill of Rights? Well, uh, absolutely. And, and in fact, this is something which is already under active consideration. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's dropped off the um, uh, attention of the newspapers uh, recently if anyone still reads newspapers, um, is that uh, the UK's Human Rights Act um, has been under active review uh, for some years. Mm. Now, the, the Human Rights Act, uh, you remember, was a, a largely a brainchild of um, the Labour governments in 1997-98. And, and, it was the first time in, in 97 that a government came into office uh, with a manifesto commitment to implement in domestic law the requirements of the European Convention on Human Rights, not anything to do with the EU, just, just the, the Convention rights as they apply to the UK. And that was done in the Human Rights Act, which came into force 
uh, fully in, in October 2000, um, just a few months, a couple of months before the then not legally binding EU Charter, uh, what, what was uh, agreed. Um, the, the Human Rights Act um, makes it um, a legal requirement that public authorities normally should act in a manner compatible with convention rights. And if a, a local authority or a government department or, or, or a, uh, probably um, a, a university or hospital fails to comply with your convention rights, then you can bring an action uh, either to have the uh, decision quashed or to get damages if you've suffered loss, and all the usual things. There's, a, there's an exception for that if um, th there's legislation which unequivocally uh, compels the authority or a court to act in a way which is incompatible with the right. But the, the, the general presumption is that there's a legal obligation to comply. Now that's something which for various reasons uh, the, the, the uh, Conservative Party has become increasingly unhappy about, also some elements in the Labour Party. Um, and we very nearly uh, lost the Human Rights Act uh, in the aftermath of the 2010 election. If the Conservatives had come into office without a coalition partner, uh, that we would probably have seen um, a, a um, review leading to significant changes to or repeal of the Human Rights Act. In the event, because the Liberal Democrat coalition partners referred this, uh, would, wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't allow that to happen, um, the matter was referred to a commission and the commission was uh, told to consider whether the UK should be given a Bill of Rights to replace the Human Rights Act. Um, at that stage, it was still assumed that the UK would remain a party to the European Convention in international law, whatever happened to the national law. We've been a party to the Convention since 1950. We were one of the first signatories. And so in international law, the UK has been consistently committed to complying with these rights for 65, 66 years now. So that wouldn't necessarily change irrespective of EU membership? It wouldn't change through EU membership. It would take a separate decision by the UK to ditch its commitment on the international plane to human rights through the Convention. Um, and the, it's fair to say the, the Commission in, in 2012 came up with no clear recommendation. Uh, but the, the issue was parked until the 2015 election when the Conservative Party, with a, a manifesto commitment to replacing the Human Rights Act with a Bill of Rights for the UK, uh, received a mandate to form a government on its own. Um, and, and since then, for the last um, 14 months or so, um, people have been beaving away in the Ministry of Justice, uh, working on something um, that uh, may or may not replace or supplement or um, just repeal the uh, Human Rights Act for domestic legal purposes. We'll still have the EU requirement which in some ways will be tied to the European Convention rights. We'll still have, probably, an international law obligation subject to the supervision of the European Court of Human Rights to comply with Convention rights within our territory. But what might change is the way in which those rights are protected, or as it may turn out to be not protected in domestic law, in areas not falling within the competence of the EU. 
Now we're going to get, we're told, a um, consultation paper in July about that. Um, and that'll uh, keep us all happily occupied for a little while. Um, my guess is that the changes will be um, possibly significant but not earth-shattering. And a lot of what will be done will be um, largely cosmetic. But we'll see. OK, David, so uh, to conclude, is there um, one particular aspect of uh, fundamental human rights in the run-up uh, to the referendum that you feel uh, could have been better communicated or, or subject to more debate? Yes. Discussion of human rights in this country is, is, is in popular terms, um, very poor. Um, there is a general failure by politicians, a lot of journalists, and I have to admit, even some of my students, um, to distinguish between the different regimes for protecting and identifying human rights. And an assumption very often that the EU regime and the European Convention on Human Rights regime are the same. Well, that is not so, and I hope that the discussion that we've had in the last few minutes will have um, uh, demonstrated that we really need to be much more careful to distinguish between the different systems for protecting fundamental rights or human rights at the international level through treaties like the European Convention on Human Rights, at the supranational level through the EU's charter and also general principles of EU law, and at domestic level through partly through the Human Rights Act. But it has to be said also, and this is something we haven't talked about, the rich history of protection for civil liberties, um, which exists in common law in England and Wales, um, and also increasingly over the last few years, a growing um, interest in whether there were some fundamental common law rights which courts could or should give particular protection to. Um, so we shouldn't assume that simply because we lose, if we lose, one of the sources of rights, or even two of the sources of rights, that there'll be a vacuum. And we may very well find that the uh, consultation paper on a Bill of Rights, which is coming out in a few weeks, um, will suggest both new rights and new ways of protecting them. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you.